Hello again, and welcome to Bee Swarm Simulator. In this game, you raise a legion of bees to fight, farm, and manufacture, all while you reap the profits and they get nothing! In fact, their very existence is tied to you. You hatch them. You incubate the egg. So you might as well be God. But how do these buzzy little guys, as well as the world they live in, actually work? That's a question I'm going to be answering today. Before we talk about the bees themselves, we need to go over some core mechanics. When a player first joins, there are a few things created in their player object. The first few ones are integer values for how much honey and pollen the player has. Then, a folder called items is filled with folders for each shop, and each of those folders contain bool values for each item in that shop that track if the player owns the item the bool values are associated with. There is another folder called powerups, which starts empty, but this will be important later. Then there is a folder for quests, which contains folders for each quest the player has. These folders are named the name of the quest, and they contain an object value and at least one integer value. The object value is set to the NPC that issued the quest, and the integer values are the requirements for completing the quest. The integer values are named the requirement for completing the quest, and the values of the integer value is how much the player has completed. These integer values also have an attribute for how much is needed to complete the quest. Attributes are additional values that can be attached to an object and they can be referenced by scripts just like any other property. And you should reference this channel to a friend and also hit that subscribe button. I'm coming up on a thousand subscribers so it would be a huge help, but the decision is ultimately yours. When the player interacts with an NPC, there's a script that checks the folder for the quest that NPC issued. It pulls all the integer values for the quest, and if the amount completed is greater than the required amount for all the integer values, the quest is completed and the quest folder will be destroyed. If not, the NPC will tell the player to get back out there. This is done using a statement called return in the function that checks the quests. What this does is it immediately stops the function because there's no point in checking other requirements if you don't have 350,000 pollen for the black bear. Speaking of dialogue, how does that work? How the dialogue in this game works is by using an array. You can imagine an array as a script. No, not that kind of script, I mean this kind. Each array is a set of dialogue and each of the values are lines that are cycled through by clicking on the box. When you press E to interact with an NPC, a remote event sends a message to a local script dedicated to handling dialogue. This message contains the array of dialogue, the name of the NPC, and the player to show the dialogue to. Going back to that powerups folder, let's touch on those. When a player touches a powerup token, it creates an integer value with a few attributes. The name of the integer value is the name of the effect. All of the icons for the effects are in the replicated storage. When a power-up is added to the player's power-up folder, a script looks for an image with the same name as the power-up and uses that as the icon. Why the replicated storage and not the server storage? Because these images need to be accessed by the client and only the client has access to player GUI. The value of the integer value is how long the effect lasts. An attribute called level is how potent the effect is, which is increased through combos, and there's another attribute called max time, which is used for the duration bar th thingamabobber, whatever it's called. Now let's talk about everyone's favorite part, which is the... How these bees move is by using something called the tween service. What a tween is, in case you haven't watched my last couple of dissections, is a way for objects to move smoothly from one point to another. Another thing they can be used for is to make flying objects fly. These bees are all anchored, meaning they don't respond to Roblox's physics engine. This means that they can tell Isaac Newton to kick the curb while they completely disregard gravity. They also tell Isaac Newton that his three laws of motion are a fat lie. No matter how hard you push an anchored part, it will not move. And it will also not move you. Despite that, anchored parts can still be moved using tweens, which is how these guys can move. Parts also have a property that determines if they can collide or not. If this property is set to false, other parts will pass right through them. The bees don't have collisions because if they did, they would be getting stuck on everything and it would be really annoying for players. Now how do these guys figure out where to go? The bees are all models, which is a collection of parts, and in that model is a string value called state. This can be one of three values, active, honey, fight, and sleeping. Wait, did the script seriously th say three values? 
There's four anyways. When a bee is active, they will tween their way to the player before using the trusty lerp function to figure out if there are any flowers close enough to them. If so, they will fly to the flower. Upon arriving, the bee shrinks the flower's part height and gives pollen to the player based on what type of flower it is. How the bee knows what player owns them is by using an object value. Since all players are objects in the players folder, the object value in the bee, which is called owner, has the player's player object set as the value. This is how most tycoon games keep track of who owns a plot. The bee can simply take the value of owner and add to their pollen value. But how does a bee know when to stop? It's time to stop! The pollen holder is a child of the player's character, which is their physical avatar. The character is a property of the player object, so the bees could reference it with this line of code. The pollen holder has an attribute that determines the maximum amount of pollen it can hold. When a bee collects pollen, it checks if the player's pollen count will exceed the capacity of the pollen holder. If so, the player's pollen will be set to the capacity of the pollen holder. The bees also check how far away the player is after they finish collecting pollen, and if they're far enough away, they'll pathfind to the player. If they're close enough to the player, they'll just pathfind to another flower. All the bees are in a folder called bees, and in that folder, there are folders for each hive. When a player joins and claims a hive, the hives folder is renamed to that player and all the player's bees are copied into the folder. When a player presses E near the hive, the game takes the player's bee folder and gets an array of all the bees in that folder. Then, a for loop is used with a function called iPairs, which goes through every single bee the player has to make sure they're not sleeping, and if not, the bee state is set to honey. In this state, the bees will pathfind to the player and subtract from their pollen after their tween finished. That pollen is added to an attribute in the bee called held pollen. The bee pathfinds to their comb and subtracts all of the pollen from held pollen and adds it to the player's honey count. The bee stays in the honey state until it tries to take from the player's pollen when there's none left, which will switch the bee state back to active. The player can also press E again to run that same for loop to switch all the bee states back to active. The bees enter the fight state if they are within a certain distance of an enemy. They will stay in the fight state until the enemy has been killed or the player gets far enough away. Certain bees, such as the rage bee, will only spawn power-ups when they're in the fight state. The only state I haven't talked about is sleeping. Bees have an attribute called energy that slowly decays over time. When energy reaches zero, the bee will change their state to sleeping and go back to their comb. Upon arriving, a while loop is used to check if the bee's energy is less than their max energy. A while loop loops a set of code over and over again as long as the condition remains true, which in this case is if the bee's energy is less than their maximum energy. Once their energy equals their maximum energy, any code after the while loop will be ran, which includes setting the bee's state back to active. As I mentioned earlier, bees will not do anything else when their state is sleeping, including making honey, which is ensured using an if statement. Now that we've solved the mystery of the bees, let's talk about... Of all the games I've dissected so far, this is the first one with music that changes depending on where you are. All the music is in a folder called Sound Service, but the music isn't played directly from there because anything played in Sound Service can be heard by everyone, oh, yeah. and not everyone is going to be in the same place. What the game does instead is it uses a local script to create a sound object inside the player's character. Each section of the map is covered by a giant invisible part that detects if the player touched them. Upon being touched, it uses a remote event to tell that local script, since touch events happen on the server, to change the sound ID property of the sound in the character to the same sound ID as the music for that part of the map in the sound service. Since the sound was made with a local script, only the player that moved to the other part of the map has their music changed, and no one else can hear their music. Pretty genius if you ask me. Thank god I can't hear your music otherwise I would roast you so hard for listening to the covet by KSI. Huh? So that will do it for this video. What game would you like to see me dissect next? Make sure to let me know in the comment section below.